Alright, we're on. Welcome, Facebook friends, Harvest family. Uh, and, and tomorrow, YouTube. And tomorrow, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so if you're catching us on YouTube, you're, you're slightly delayed, but still fantastic. And I know we do have some folks that have mentioned to me that they watch it, but not on Wednesday night. So, okay. so that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, we're thrilled that you're with us. Um, Matthew Bible Study. I think we have three weeks after this, so four down, three to go. Uh, I think the week before Thanksgiving we end, but we'll keep you posted. And uh, Matthew 25 is yes. our chapter for tonight, and Alan is our discussion leader. Alrighty. So, uh, as, as Tom said, Matthew 25, so we're going to go ahead and jump in. Uh, there's some. Uh, there's three big chunks here, but I think the, the servant we're going to break into two chunks, just because it's a lot of reading, and uh, uh, I think that makes sense. There's some parts. Anyway, we'll get to that. So we're going to read... Um, Verses 1 through 13 first. Are you reading? Read your sand. Quiet. I don't know what that was, but I'm ready. Go ahead. <laughs> Sam, you really elevate the entertainment value when you're here. <laughs> We're, we miss you when you're gone. It's just a bunch of grown ups then. Good <laughs> job. <laughs> then the kingdom of heaven will be like. Ten bridesmaids, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take a long extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming! Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourself. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Wow, well, I've, I've never... <laughs> Dramatic reading. I've, I've never really thought of Jesus going, I don't know you. <laughs> That's my takeaway from the night. That's, I don't know you. Yeah. Yo. Yo. <laughs> yo, yo. <laughs> so, um, so this is an interesting parable uh, in a lot of ways. And um, it back in, in, in the Jewish culture, there were actually three steps to get married. There was the engagement. Uh, and that usually happened when... Um, the two who were getting married were probably a little younger, and it was generally an agreement between fathers of different families. But that was the engagement, believe it or not. Uh, then came the betrothal, which was a ceremony of promises between the future bridegroom and the future bride. And then after the betrothal, there was about a year where the bridegroom left the bride and went and did his thing. And his thing was supposed to be to create a place for them to live. Okay, so he had about a year basically to build a house, you know, and get his career in order and everything and be ready for his wife. Uh, and then the actual wedding and wedding feast would be when that year was up, the bridegroom would come back to get his bride and take her from her parents' house to the new house that he his, that was going to be their house. Okay, so this is talking about that third step mm -hmm. that the bridegroom is going to come back now. When the bridegroom came back for the wedding, or the wedding feast, that was what it was called, the bridesmaids, and typically there were ten, would come out to meet the bridegroom and his, his party and, and like a, a parade kind of procession with, with torches. And the, the, it says, says lamps here, but I think the Aramaic, Aramaic word is for torches, not for, the, not for a table lamp, like you, the word you would use for a lamp that you put on the table inside, but more for a torch. And the way they did their torches, they had like a little bowl and put a, a cloth that was soaked in oil in the top of a, of a stick. And it would be, 
So they would they would bring and they would in this procession bring the bridegroom into the the bride's parents' house where they would have the wedding feast, and then after the wedding feast, of course, then the bride bridegroom would take the bride away. Um, and so here we have these these ten um, bridesmaids that go out because the only reason that they would go out like that would be is the bride, they know the bridegroom's coming. So they go out to meet the bridegroom and his party in his procession. Uh, but it says the bridegroom was delayed. Mm -hmm. uh, so now what do you do? So now they're just waiting for him because he was supposed to be here. Everybody been like that, right? You know, mm -hmm. your friends are supposed to meet you. Where are they at? They were supposed to be here an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Something came up. I think one of the biggest. This is also pretty interesting too because it's bold because uh, before this in the Old Testament God called himself the bridegroom. So when Jesus is calling himself the bridegroom, he's basically in Jewish culture saying, I'm God. Mm -hmm. That's just a little side thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the biggest things that I, I, I took out of this is the concept that Jesus called five of them foolish and five of them wise. And I just want to make sure I point out that he didn't say five of them were good and five of them were bad. Mm -hmm. They were just unwise. They lacked wisdom <coughs> to prepare themselves for what was coming, to prepare themselves for an unexpected, the unexpected. Um, kind of like the uh, the Boy Scout motto: "Always be prepared." Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <coughs> but that that was one of the biggest things that I I, I took because. It's easy for us to read and go, those guys were the bad ones. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and Jesus didn't say they were bad. He didn't say they were evil or the other ones were good. He just said they were <coughs> wise. They were, they were foolish in what they were, in what they were expecting God to do. Mm -hmm. They were expecting God to work on their timetable. When we all know God likes to work on his timetable. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a shopkeeper open at midnight. If they could go and get oil, <laughs> yeah, it's like what's that going at midnight? Yeah, I do think with this story, it's easy to read side meanings into it, and um, I think it might have been maybe it was Jack Hayford's Bible that. Um, Basically, the, the, the point of the parable, um, it's what it says, the point of the parable is found here in verse 13. In light of his coming, be prepared since you don't know the day or the hour. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've either read this or taught it or listened to somebody else teach it and talk about it. They didn't share. Why didn't they share? Is this, right. does this justify not sharing with people? That's not the point of the parable. Right. Um, you know, and again, if you interpret the oil as being symbolic of the Holy Spirit, you really can't do that for somebody else beyond a certain point. You know, if if, if this is a prophetic picture of where the the bowl or the you know lamp and the oil is in us, I can't really give you the oil I have. Um, you have to get your own. You have to get your own. Well, that, yeah, that's that was that, that's good. I thought I was going to say that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, but you're right. You can't. I can't get the Holy Spirit for you. Right. I, I can only get my Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit for me. Right. Um, and so I, I, you know, I don't think it's anti-sharing or necessarily a statement about boundaries. You know, I, that's really not the point of it all. But it may have been a friend's house. You know, we're we're gonna go get some from the neighbor. Well, I mean, I know there's a, that's not germane to the story, but I was just like, where are they going in midnight right. to get oil? Right. right. <laughs> But also, don't you can't be unprepared till the last minute. There you go, and hope to catch up. There right. you go. Yeah. Well, in the uh, Passion translation, when it says "come meet him," it says this is not simply meet him, for it is a rare Greek noun that means to have a meeting or an encounter. And I, I don't think I ever read the story in light of that possibility of am I, a, you know, a bridesmaid full of the Holy Spirit, waiting for Jesus to come, and then to have an encounter with him, 
before we actually go into the wedding feast. So that, that sent me down a whole other kind of secrets of the secret place type of trail. And went, wow, never, never viewed this story in light of that. Um, but I, I think that, you know, again, the, the real meaning of the parable, we can read the side stuff into it, um, is about being prepared, being ready. And I think we talked about this either last week or the week before, because Jesus is telling a bunch of different things that have that same basic point about being ready. You don't know the day or the hour. Um, and having that balance of being ready at any moment, you know, for his return. But also, again, none of us are guaranteed the next breath. You know, you, my, my joke in our family is, you know, I could step in front of the truck, you know, tonight. You know, what if that truck finds me, runs me over? Um, but the, the flip of that is, am I preparing, especially am I preparing those behind me? to carry on the message for generations to come. So I, I think that's really the balance. Not being so mindful of his coming that you don't plan for the future or prepare for it, but not being so caught up in that that you're not ready. The, the other thing that kind of jumped out to me, just because I was rereading a little bit on the last chapter, is this is this kind of is, I think, a, a, a when he talked last at the end of the last chapter, he was talking about the sensible servant and, and you know us relating to Jesus as a servant master mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. And then right after he says that, he's talking about us relating to him as a bridesmaid, mm -hmm. bride, bridegroom, part of the family kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's interesting that he, he he talks about both of those types of relationships mm -hmm. because I um, I know I see people and I know out there that people relate to Jesus as a master servant kind of thing. And there's a little bit of that underneath anything mm -hmm. because he is our Lord, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also, so it, it, it seems like they're counter tutored to each other, but I think that what he's trying to say, he's putting them back to back here. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, this is one way that, that our relationship, you know, in other words, our relationship isn't a simple one, one way kind of street. It's a multifaceted yes. type of thing. And so you have this other relationship um, that is more like, you know, you're in here with the party with me and you're part of the, mm -hmm. the, the bridal party, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, which you don't, I mean, servants didn't come to the bridal party. You know, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think this, this group kind of points out, um, it's like, I, I know, and I know because of, you know, being in the band and talking to different people in different, a lot of different situations that are not inside of the uh, cultural walls of the church. <coughs> um, but there's a lot of people who, who look at Jesus like, again, they, they have this concept that if I, if I give my life to Jesus, then I have to, I'm, I'm trading fun for, for Jesus and I, I can't, mm -hmm. I want to get my fun first. And then I'll, and then I'll have, there's this, there's this <laughs> delaying tactic that they have. Um, and, and, this part is really very clear that once the door of death shuts, it, it doesn't get opened again. Right. Do, doesn't matter how, how hard you dang on it, or that you were a bridesmaid. Right. If you're not ready and that that door shuts on you, it doesn't get opened again. Right. You know, which is a little bit you know. Mm -hmm. eh, uh, but it's still it's you know it. it God's not going to shut the door on you. Right. You're the one that's putting him off, or you're the one that's shutting the door on him. Right. And it can still be opened if you can hear this message right now. Yeah. But when, 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 when death is done, when, yes. it, when that happens, the door's shut. It's done. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's most of these, I think these three stories pretty much have that heaven and hell kind of tone to them. Um, and one thing I read said, well, um, you know, it could just be a loss of reward. And then I went back and reread the text and went, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I was stretching it a little bit. Yeah, I think the outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth is not that you lost your reward in heaven. Right. I think it's that you lost your shot. Um, and if that's true, and I think the Bible is very clear about that, it's a gracious thing to issue that warning. Yeah. You know, yeah. that... that um, Several times through the scripture, it says something to the effect of, you know, death comes and then judgment, and everyone dies once. 
and the Bible is clearly not into reincarnation. Um, and like the thief on the cross, it's never too late. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there is a there is a too late, you know, if, if you keep putting it off type of thing. Yeah. So. The other thief on the other cross. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know there was proof. Of, of where that guy's heart was at because of what he said, because of, you know, what he did. So there was fruit of repentance, so to speak. But, yeah, there, there is a time, and, and you can't put it off too long and you, until you find yourself, oops, mm -hmm. never got any oil. Yeah. Um, so can, yeah. I, can I make a point or comment about this? Yeah. Um, if you uh, remember, we back up a few chapters, we've been talking about Jesus has been talking about the theme of um, the dispensation of the, you know, his time ending and the Holy Spirit being the time of, of the next dis dispensation. You know, he's talking to the disciples about end times. He's talking about, um, you know, what's going to happen before he returns and all that. So this is just a continuation of what we, he has already been talking about. He's putting it in story form and parable form for greater understanding for them, but in an eschatological understanding of it, he's talking about the time right before he comes back mm -hmm. and what you're going to need. And this story illustrates you're going to need the Holy Spirit yes. during mm -hmm. that time of tribulation and, and persecution and, and rampant deception and, and all this other stuff he's already been talking about. Um, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. It's going to be too late to try to get the Holy Spirit as the bridegroom shows up in the sky and the sign of his coming returns. Mm -hmm. Those ones that don't have the Holy Spirit are going to cry out for the rocks to fall on them. Those ones who do have the Holy Spirit are going to be enter into the wedding feast with him when he shows up. But that's going to be too late. So you better get it now. Get the Holy Spirit now. And you know, embrace the Holy Spirit as a true uh, being the third person of the Trinity of, of God. You know, embrace the Holy Spirit and don't just pass it by and say, well, you know, that's not for today and, you know, and that's ethereal. I don't know what to do about that. I don't understand. No, it, make it your aim to understand and listen to what he's saying. Be like the wise ones, the bridegrooms or bridesmaids who were wise and gave themselves to understanding what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to... Listen to the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit in your life, you know. And so, I mean, really, he's just continuing on what he's saying. And um, like I say, if you if you kind of let's not forget those other chapters. The Bible wasn't divided into mm -hmm. different chapters. He's continuing his conversation with them about about the you know end times es eschatology, if you will, mm -hmm. which is a big word. Everybody goes, oh, I don't understand that. But, you know, this he's saying this is how you understand it. You get the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, with the word eschatology, um, the third edition of the book Victorious Eschatology by Harold Everly is now available. Oh, um, he I, did it another one? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, this is a third edition. I, I don't... We may have had a paper copy of it, but it caught my attention in the newsletter, he said, and available on Kindle. Okay. And so I went and put it in my Kindle wish list and wow. thought, when I have a little more time than I do right now, that thing was... yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's less than father-son theology at least, but um, Victoria's eschatology is about not believing the world will get worse and worse, but that the church will shine brighter and brighter. I think it would be so cool to have Harold Everly tune in with us and give some insight into our Bible study. He, he, he did basically the same thing a couple of winters. Yeah, he and, did. And Kim and I tuned in. It was oh, just cool. him and his he wife. And his wife talking. Him and his wife sitting in front of a laptop. And, it was awesome. And you could chat in questions and stuff, so it was, it was neat. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's my two cents about that. No, yeah. that's good, yeah. Definitely the... the you need you need the Holy Spirit to get to the part where Jesus comes back, and when He gets here, it's too late. Yep. Right. So again, that concept of if 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 you're in the boat where you're feeling like you know you're believing the lie that you you're trading fun for Jesus and you're wanting to have your fun, you know you, you get off the fence. 
Yeah. Because you never know when, like you say, that bus is going to sneak up on you. Yeah. <laughs> Not to be morbid or anything, but I mean, really, yeah. you know, you don't know when, when the next day is going to come or not. And um, this part of this parable is, like you said, the, the key part is keep, keep watch. You don't know when the day and hours. Be ready. Yeah. And how do you be ready? Get the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any internet comments that we have? I, I don't have any comments, but I do. I have shared it with several people. It looks like a couple people are watching with us. So welcome who, whoever's watching with us online. Welcome, yeah. <laughs> if you have comments, uh, you're, if you're watching live, it, the broadcast is a little bit delayed, so send them in and Kim will grab them and we'll, we'll catch them when we get them. All right. Good. All right. Uh, next is the parable of the three servants. Are you ready to read? Yeah. Are, are we going to go full drama or maybe pack? Or what are we? Or, I don't know yet. All right. So we're going to go from 14. Uh, on, let's just go from 14 to 18 just for a quick. I want to talk a little bit about that first. And then talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. You got to read it first. What? I'm just saying it. Read it. <laughs> Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportions to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver do, dug a hole in the ground and hid the minister, master's money. Okay. All right. So, uh, I, I, I don't want to, unless somebody else has more comments, I don't have a lot to talk about this, but I, I thought it was something that was fairly important because in a lot, a lot of translations, it doesn't say bag of silver, it says talents. It says five talents, mm-hmm. two talents, and one talents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's fairly, um, you know, the majority belief is that a talent was worth about 6,000 denarii. If that was true, then one talent would have taken your average worker in that day and age 20 years to earn. Wow. So I always thought about this. I always felt bad sometimes for the guy who got one talent. I thought, you know, that's not that much, but the reality is, that was a lot. Yeah. And so I, I don't want anybody to disparage, and if they're thinking about themselves and they're comparing themselves to somebody else, and thinking I don't have the same, you know, resources, the same time, the same talents as somebody else. Mm-hmm. This is not about how many talents that he gave each one. It's about what they did with the talents. Right. And the one talent was still a significant amount of money. If you think about, just think about your own paycheck, how much you, and this would be if they didn't have rent and they were living in their mom's basement. <laughs> uh, it would have taken them 20 years to earn, in a, at a standard wage, to earn one talent worth of, of about 6,000 denarii. So, you know, if you think about it in this day and age, think about working for 20 years and everything you made went into a savings, and that is what was given to this guy. Wow. So it wasn't an insignificant amount, first mm-hmm. of all. But second of all, it's not about how much he gave to each one. It's about what they did with it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I just wanted to mention that we have uh, Pastor Isaac, Apostle Isaac Ross, oh. t- tuning hey. in with us. So welcome. Please yeah. uh, give us any insights you have. Boy, that's a... We got a heavy hitter on the team tonight. There we go. Tonight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. My friend Isaac creeps on our Bible study from time oh, good. to time. So it's <laughs> well, good welcome. to have you with us, brother. Welcome, brother. We had a great breakfast with a group of pastors this morning. Yeah. Great at the police station. So. That's great. So I, I don't know if anybody else had anything about that little piece there, but I, I, I thought it would, because this is a long thing yes. that was, and sure. I wanted to talk about that part mm-hmm. because I feel like there's, our culture, you know, the, and, I, and this is something I think the enemy propagates because 
comparing yourself is not a, it is something that helps to divide you from other people. Mm-hmm. And, and Jesus, God is not about dividing you That's from right. other people. That's so I, I really felt really strongly about making sure that that point was made, that it's not about what, how much was each person was given. Mm-hmm. Right? It's about what you do with it. Right. Yes. You know, so don't compare yourself to somebody else and think, I don't have as much talent as that guy has, or I don't have as much, you know, I can't do plumbing like my brother does. Mm. My, my brother has a gift with that stuff. Like, I mean, when we have a problem and he comes over to help me, thank God, and he, I mean, he can look at the pipes in the, in the wall, he'll, he'll go, yeah, and I'm thinking, all right, I've got a notepad, like, what do we need? You know, and he looks at it for like two minutes, goes, yeah, let's go to Bolo's. You, you, we didn't write nothing down. He goes, no, it's fine. We just need a couple of elbows. We need this, we need that. It's fine. I'm like, okay, we go. We get the stuff. He comes back in like 20 minutes. It's all done and there's no water on the floor. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I have no talent. No, right. I'm using the word talent differently than this particular parable, par- right. but I don't have that gift. You know, God didn't give me that gift with, with the plumbing. Right, right. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't make me any less than him or him right. any more than me. Right. You, you know? Well, it's it's interesting that it does say that you're given the, this this bag and this bag according to your abilities. Right. And I think it's, um, you know, part, I think big part of what God is saying is He's not going to hold us accountable for something that He hasn't already equipped us to do. Absolutely. He's not going to say, you know, you go do this when He hasn't already supplied everything you need to do what he's calling you to do. If he's called you to change the world, he's going to give you every resource necessary to do and that. And here's, here's something else to think about, too, in, in light of that. And this is something that I think Holy Spirit was just telling me about, and it kind of sparked off of what you just said mm-hmm. about in proportion to what you're, is available. Has anybody here tried to take on a job that was way above what they were capable of doing? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how long did it take you to begin to feel so overwhelmed, so stressed, anxiety, you know, God's not going to ask you to do a job that he hasn't equipped you to do properly. That's yeah. right. And so when you look at and compare yourself to other people, and you go, well, I wanted two talents. But if two talents was going to overwhelm you so much and make your life miserable, yeah. why would God want to do that to you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And again, just, that comparison, don't do it. Yeah. Bad thing. I was just studying something about families in crisis because I'm, taken class and it talked about the ABCX model of family stress and it basically is A is the stressor, B is what resources are, are available and how the family utilizes those resources. How they, how well they do to utilize their resources determines whether they'll have crisis when the stress comes or whether they'll overcome. And that's kind of how it, how it is in life, isn't it? If we utilize the, all the gifts that God's given us and the talents that he's given us, then we'll be overcomers, you know, and, and we'll be, instead of the guy who buries it in the ground and out of fear and protection and, you know, fear to step out, if you take a risk and you go and use all your talents, then you'll succeed and be an overcomer. If you bury it in the ground out of fear, worried that you're going to not succeed, then that's really the big sin here, isn't it? Not it's trusting. the one who, you're yeah, not trusting. He got he goes and buries the talent instead of using it. Well, let's read read on that. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Sam, so we're going to go 19 uh, through 30. That's a lot. Uh, I can't even lot. count that high. Well, then just read it. You don't have to count it. That's good. <laughs> After a long time, their masters returned from their. God. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant whom have he had trusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, "Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more." Their master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Mm -hmm. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. 
harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant! If you knew I haven't, I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gather crops, I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who have well, what? To those who use well what they have are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even with little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm. Yikes. <laughs> Already. That was a nice and lovely one, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Okay, so we have, again, so we have five talents to two talents to one talent. We've got the three different servants. And uh, it, so it says that the, the first servant with five talents went and invested the money and, and did work with it, and he made five more mm -hmm. and brought it back. Uh, same thing with the two. But the one, the guy with the one, took his talent and he buried it in the ground. And you know, when the master came back, the guy who buried it in the ground, first of all, went last, presented him. Mm -hmm. So he saw what the other two did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after seeing what the other two did, he was still unrepentant about what he did. Notice he said, he didn't say, I'm sorry, I just did nothing with it. He, mm -hmm. he made excuses for what he did. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was afraid that, you know, and I knew you were bad. I, I, here's your money back. Now, the good part of that is that he understands that when God gives you something, it's not really yours, it's still God's. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility to steward that mm -hmm. in the right way. Mm -hmm. So he's not, he didn't fall on that one, but there's a lot of people, I think, in this world that think when God gives you something, it's theirs. Right. And it's no longer God's. Yeah. And I got bad news for you. It's that's not the way it works. Right. You you are a steward to God's things. Um, so, at least this third says, "Here's what's yours." He already he knew it was still his. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't something that God uh, that it was not God's possession anymore. Um, but I was I was stuck on this one thing that um, in most translations it says, "Why didn't you put it in the bank?" I could at least got an interest. Mm -hmm. Because it, uh, I'm not sure that that's what it translates to the right way mm. in, in, in the Aramaic. And I think uh, as I'm digging, the more I dig into this, the more I'm believing that what it's really saying is, why didn't you give it to the church where I could have gotten some good out of it? Mm. Um, and how that relates to us personally, when God gives you resources, when he gives you gifts and talents, money and time, he's giving them to you for you to go out and put them to work to help rescue people into his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen. When he's giving you those gifts and you sit on the couch, mm. you're wasting those gifts. At the very least you could do. So here's the thing. If you can't go to, um, what was it, where did we go? Um, Belize. 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 If you can't go to Belize and do ministry, then maybe you can go to church and give money to support the Belize. And you can pray to support. That's the interest that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. At least if you're not, if you don't have the talent to go, dot, or you don't have the time to go knocking door to door, mm -hmm. then you can go and serve in the church and clean the toilets and vacuum the the, 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 mm -hmm. the carpets and get the place ready for the people who are going to come in from that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's an interest that you can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Rather than hiding it and burying it under the ground or sitting on your couch at home mm -hmm. right? and doing nothing with your resources and your talents mm -hmm. that God has given you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. That's good. So you're you're saying that 
It's not really about the interest you could get financially by putting it in the bank, which is maybe 0.1% or something, which yeah, is so yeah. small. And, and the fact that I don't really think they had banks in interest, like it, there was laws, I mean, you could, it was legal to charge interest to Gentiles, but it wasn't like, you, you know, I, this, we're talking about, he's talking to the disciples, he's talking right, to right. Jews. So I, I don't think it's, different, to say different putting financial. it in the bank in interest, I don't think right. there was a, I don't really think there was a bank like we think of banks. Right, right. right. Different um, economy, different Yeah, time. it's a diff different kind of thing. So that doesn't make sense. I, and I think uh, some of the translations, some of the Bible studies I was reading and poking around in that, um, it, it was coming out mm -hmm. and it was, it was, why didn't you give it to the church? At least we could have gotten some good after it. Mm -hmm. Right, there you go. Uh, so, uh, and, and then when you come back to the fact that I don't really think that, you know, I know he's using money in this parable, but I think he's talking about resources. Mm -hmm. Right. Which equates to your time, your, your, not only your money, but your time, your money, your... Your, your your gifts that you have your I, I keep trying not to say talents because it relates to talent <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm saying like like your talent to do things right. you know um, so it's talking about resources so it's, it, it, if you're taking your resources and you're wasting them watching TV on the couch every day you're you're burying your talent you're doing exactly what this parable is saying not to do at the very least you could be giving your money to the church to help the, the missions offering that we're going to be doing at right. the first of the month. You could be um, praying uh, to get, I mean, I, I think we all, nobody, I don't think anybody really grasps the power of what prayer can be. They think about it like, oh, it's the last resort, all these you can pray. You no, know, pray. It's, I mean, there's there's things you can do if you can't get out to do the knocking on the door. If you can't go to Belize on the mission trip, there are things that you can do that your interest can pay pay into those things. Yeah, that's that, good. Makes sense. That's good. Yeah, I, I think that's excellent. It's it's there in the Aramaic, the footnote in the Passion, you know, really lends to it that direction. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me from the message, what he says to the two servants who doubled what they had. Um, well, firstly, is after a long absence. Mm -hmm. What's it say in the in the Passion? It says. Um, after much time had passed. Mm -hmm. And so many things you read, and I'm, I'm going through this with preparing this week for Joshua, that it, it kind of just says matter of fact, yeah, he fought these kings in these areas and then he won. And then at the end it says, he waged war for a long time. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they went from Jerusalem to, you know, it could have been like 40 they years. They jumped in the car and do it. You know? It says it in right. one, one or two sentences for right. 40 years. <laughs> so that speaks to me about a lifetime. Right. You know, that it's a long time um, until that accountability comes. So after a long absence, the master came back, settled up with them. Uh, the one who had $5,000 is what the message says, showed him he had doubled his investment. His master commended him. Good work, you did your job well. From now on, be my partner. Mm. And again, I, I know we talk about this a lot at Harvest, um, and, and we're talking about it in the Joshua series I'm doing on Sunday, <coughs> but that idea of partnership. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, who supplied the money? The master did. Who did the work? The servants did. Yeah. You know, and then he comes back and says, you did a good job, you know, now be my partner. <coughs> And I, I'm always struck with there was somebody who was in the church a number of years ago has moved away. And uh, they had mixed emotions about this because it meant you got more responsibility. <laughs> and they kind of didn't want more responsibility if they did well. Um, but you'll have grace to do it. And there's this spirit of celebration. You know, let's partner together and, and we'll have a good time working together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I just thought that's amazing that Literally, the word in the message is, be my partner. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea of celebration. It's a good thing. It isn't, I'm going to pile more on your back. Mm -hmm. It's, we're going to do this together, and it's going to be awesome. Well, in light of that, jump down to, uh, uh, if we look at the, um, the passion in verse 29, it says, for the one uh, who has will be given more until he overflows with abundance. Mm -hmm. And the one with hardly anything, even what little he has, will be taken from him. But I love I like the footnote here because it, it goes a little bit deeper. It says, I'm just going to read the footnote for you. By implication, the parable is saying that the one who has the heart of a faithful stewardship will, give him, be, will be given more to manage. 
And the one who has very little faithfulness, very little wisdom, very little integrity will end up losing the little that he has failed to manage well. Mm -hmm. So it's not as much, it, it gives that imp impression that it's not as much that I'm going to pile more work onto you. Right. But as you grow in what you're managing, your faithfulness and, and your abilities, yes. more is going to be added because you're going to be capable of doing more. And for those who did, did nothing, they're not faithful, they're unwise, right. their foolishness is going to lose them what little they have yeah. because they're not stewarding it the right way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. That's good. Well, and I, another thing I was really struck with in this, and, and the wording of the Passion really brings this out, is that third um, servant and what he has to say to him. The one who had been trusted with 1,000 gold coins came to his master and said, Look, sir, I know that you are a hard man to please. Mm. And I, I just paused right there because oh, one of my favorite passages, and I know I say that about a lot, um, is Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Um, and in the Passion Translation, he says, I'm gentle, I'm humble, I'm easy to please. Mm -hmm. So if, if that's a quality of who Jesus really is, who God really is. This guy says, I know that you're a hard man to please. You're a shrewd and ruthless businessman who grows rich on the backs of others. I was afraid of you. Mm. Mm. He's perceiving God wrong. Yes, believing a lie. Right. And either he's believing a lie and is producing fear, or his fear has led him to believe a lie. And I think there's a lot of folks in that boat. If, if oh, I'm yeah. really fully honest, I go, there are times where I feel like that. Like and We were talking about this again amongst a group of pastors this morning. And how many of us are, are trying to make it through whatever this is, whether it's the end of the pandemic or, you know, and, and there's a realization that um, church has been one of those areas of life that has been harder than we think to get through this. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much the consensus around the table was, did we have any real problems before the pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> How easy life was. Uh, too many people, too much money, too many opportunities. <laughs> and that there can be this feeling of, you know, wow, God's, God's hard. It's harsh. This is difficult. And, and there's some truth to that. But... This just really challenges me in a good way to say, oh no, if I've been faithful and multiplied what God's given me, yeah, there may be more responsibilities, but there's this spirit of celebration when you do it right. Mm -hmm. Instead of accusing God of being hard to please mm -hmm. when he says about himself that he's easy to please. Well, there's, yes. And there's, there's so many people that perceive God as the judge sitting high up on this, on this mm -hmm. you know, stool uh, ready to bring the gavel down on you. Right. And, uh, that's not what I get from the scripture when you read it. Right. You know, it's, that's not the, the heart that I see there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, that's an important point to, to point out is he's believing a lie about, about God. Yeah. Uh, and there's, again, from my, you know, mingling around outside of the, you know, <laughs> outside uh, the, the culture of the church here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people who have that kind of concept. Oh yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I, I, I've, I've been in the presence of people who literally said to me, word for word, "Oh, I can't go to church. I probably struck down with lightning." And I looked in their eyes, and they, they, there was a, there was a measure of belief there. Yeah. I mean, I, there was, there was some jokingness. Sure. But there was a measure of belief, like, I can't, I know, no, I can't go there. Afraid of it. Right. You know, and I'm like. Oh my goodness! Yeah, you so you, you you believe in such a lie about who God is, right? right. Yeah. right. And then you just think that through a bit, and you go, as if God couldn't strike you dead here in this bar. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, and now you're protected. You know, right. was, yeah, yeah well, like, like the bars. You know, oh, God can't see in here. Well, and, there's a, there's some um, some you know truth to you know. I don't believe in atheists. I think people who are atheists most of the time had something bad happen, blamed God and got angry at God, mm. and decided they're not going to believe in God. So how can you be angry at somebody who doesn't exist? You can't. Well, you can, but it's, well, it's, it's a, illogical. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's, uh, 
uh, is probably off on a tangent, but I think that there's also another, there's a, there's a, uh, there's an undercurrent belief, I believe, mm -hmm. that gets perpetrated in a lot of novels and stuff, mm -hmm. that deities get power from their worshippers, so if you stop believing in them, they lose power. Mm. So there, I think there's the devil is perpetrating some of that. Oh yeah. That yeah. if you stop believing in God, you're going to hurt him somehow. Mm. Right. You know, and and I'm thinking, God's probably his heart's already probably breaking for you for what happened to you. Right. You know, you're not going to hurt him anymore. Right. And and you're not diminishing who he is by right. not believing in him. That's yes. Right. That, that's definitely a lie from the enemy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I but I see that I've seen that in a number of different. Yeah. Um, Currents in the, oh, in yeah. the culture in today yeah. in this day yeah. and age yes. that there's they're perpetrating this belief that that, 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 these, that I'm not saying God because they're they're talking about other things but right. the sure, deities sure. get the power from oh, yeah, the devil's still trying to win yeah, yeah. well and it, again it's like the the commander that, you know we read about last week in Joshua you know <laughs> he shows up and Joshua no. says are are you for us or or for our enemies and he's like neither. I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to take charge. I I, I just feel like that is a proclamation across our country right now mm -hmm. to say, yeah. hey guys, for everybody who's fighting the other side, culture wars, political wars, this is the word of the Lord. He's not here to pick sides, take sides. He's here to take charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's why we need to preach the Bible. When you're talking about that, the, the thought comes to me of where God, I think it's in Isaiah, God shows up and says, I fill the universe. How are you going to build a house for me? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I have everything I need. Are you going to bring me an offering? If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Right. And, and there's this conversation that, you know, God is having. And Job is another one where he's like, you know, who do you think you are? Yeah. You're going to tell me what to do. You know, I'm, I'm, my ways are higher than your ways. I'm at a whole different plane. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm going to stick it to God by not believing in Him. Right. So one, no. <laughs> he is he is self sufficient in himself, but two, he would rather die than lose even the chance to connect yeah, with each of us. That's right. That's right. So yeah, th this really struck me. And the honest truth is, I've I've been there sometimes where I've either blamed God that He was harsh, or that out of fear I haven't risked. Um, that's I knew there was something else. The Message Bible. Um, the master's response to the third servant says, The master was furious. That's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. Mm -hmm. And if, if you know Kim and I's personality at all, <laughs> I would be that guy. Yeah. I would be the one living cautiously. And it just challenges me because, again, God, God loves me. He's for me. And if you're a cautious person... <laughs> you know, connecting with us um, online, you know, don't be discouraged by that, don't be condemned, but let it embolden you. Again, I, I, I think Joshua 1.9 is the word of the Lord right now. Be strong and courageous. Be brave. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Don't lose hope. Um, don't, don't stay cautious. Be willing to risk for God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went and knocked on doors and took church to some people. Yeah. And again, I was sharing that testimony with some folks today. And they were like, wow. And I was like, oh, no. Our, our job is to take church to people on their front porch to pray with them, you know, to go share some good news with them. Whether they come inside our building or not, our job is to take it out to them. Mm -hmm. It works a lot better in here when we've done it out there. And again, I'm sitting with a circle of pastors, and they're all... Mm. agreeing and receiving the challenge at the same time because professionally we do it in the building all the time mm. but it can be an obscure place yeah i mean that wow what a challenging That's concept a that is yeah <laughs> and it's like okay let's let's take it to the public square a little bit let's yeah. take it out there you know where the people are but it's criminal to live cautiously like that mm. I've, I've spent too much time like that and again if i were to lose it and risking it for God, He has plenty. Well, and that's the other thing I I, I think about. Um, again, uh, I, I like to keep my brain engaged when I'm reading the Bible, and uh, and and that kind of grates on me because of my experience, personal experiences with God and Jesus. When He says, "I knew you were a harsh man," mm -hmm. and you know, 
um, and, and you're hard to please. I'm thinking that's that's not been my experience. Mm -hmm. That grates on me. So, you know, I start thinking about that. And I'm thinking as he's believing this lie, and I'm thinking, well, what if? What if the parable was different? What if the guy with the one talent went out and did something and only made a little bit? Right. Would he he wouldn't have been thrown out? Right. 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 Or maybe what if even God forbid what you just said. Yeah. He went out and used a talent and he came back with only half a talent. Right. But he tried. He, he tried. tried. When Jesus right. said, okay, let's give you another half talent. Let's try right. some more. Yeah. You know, how would the parable have been different? Right. 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 If this man wasn't living in fear. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. Which translates to how would your life be different if you're not living in fear? Right. Mm, that's you know, good. all the time. Yeah. And let me tell you, in today's day, if there's fear to be had everywhere. Got that right. You don't have to look very far to get it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, Peter got out of the boat. He sunk eventually, but he was the only one who got out of the boat. And, and he was the only one that walked on water. And, that's and right. Jesus was right there and pulled him right out. Right. He didn't say, how dare you get out of the boat? Right. Mm -hmm. how, how dare you lose my talent? No, great. You, you right. walked. Come on. You gave it a up. shot. Yeah. Back to the boat. <laughs> you were doing great. You know, you, you, you Why'd lost, you take your eyes off me? Lost your focus. Come on. Yeah. Right. And, and that, that does embolden me because I, I see it. Again, if you put it more in a parent-child paradigm, you know, if, if a parent you know, gives a child some money to figure out how to use money, mm -hmm. and the child loses it or misuses it or whatever, mom and dad's got more money. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we well, reload and fire again. And, and, and the good mom and dad in that situation says, let's go over what happened so you can learn what, what mistakes right. you made so yeah. you cannot make them when I give you this next down. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that, that, that's really freeing to me because it isn't about did you keep it, did you grow it. I think the bigger issue is did you risk, you know, and, and I've heard it said before that faith is spelled R-I-S-K, <laughs> you know, are you risking anything? Yeah. Um, and are you doing something that's bigger than you? Because yeah. if it's if it's Tom size, then Tom can do it. Mm -hmm. If it's God size, I need God to do it. You need the partner. Yeah. Yeah, and again... Well, it's a relationship, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't do it without him, and he won't do it without me. Mm. And that, that, that partnership, again, is... It's worth repeating when God's saying it. And, and I think that's part of what he's saying. It, it is one of the obvious things in the Joshua story. And, and right in that vein of what you're talking about, the, uh, the Passion Translation says he called him untrustworthy and lazy. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that goes right in with that risk and that you know you got to step out and do something. He's, that's yeah. what he's looking for. He's not looking for you to double that talent, so to speak. Right. But more that you stepped out, that you yeah. did something. At least the least you could have done was gone to church and given money to the police trip. You know, but mm -hmm. you, you didn't do anything. We always you, said when building a practice, you could do ten wrong things, just do it, mm -hmm. and you put the energy into the desire to grow the practice. So something will come back. It might not be anything that you did, right. but some other thing will happen and your practice will grow. It's just you mm -hmm. walking out in faith that you're telling God you want more people to take care of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'll give them to you. Yeah. you know, just because you didn't get them at the health fair or at the pet show or wherever it was you were mm -hmm. marketing, you know, they come. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, we saw the same thing that we went and did some inviting to our friend and family day and had people come who we didn't go knock on their door and have had folks, new folks in our building that we didn't touch some other way. So we sowed over here, but we're reaping over there. Mm -hmm. um, and never be afraid to spend your last dollar. That's right. That's right. Because money flows in open hands and it means that you know more is coming. Mm -hmm. And that That's was good. a tough lesson. Mm. But taught over and over and over again when we're in business. That's yeah. excellent. And I go to a seminar and with the last twenty dollars left in the account. Well, I got enough to get home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and then boom, some case would settle or whatever, would, and it would just open yeah. up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Craig good. Rochelle, I think at this year's Global Leadership Summit, said that generally, from a leadership point of view, the risk of doing nothing is greater than the risk of doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the old picture of the bicycle. Yeah. You can't be steered if you're not pedaling. Right. You know, if right. you pedal, then God can steer you where you need to go. If you don't pedal, you don't get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And again, that, that challenges me, but it also encourages me as a naturally cautious person to go, oh no, he, 
if I lose it, he'll give me more. If, right. if my heart is to, to do it and to get it right. Mm -hmm. And it, it does challenge me as a leader to say, oh, the risk of doing nothing is probably greater than the risk of just taking a crack at it. Mm -hmm. and, and many times, and we're in the midst of some things here at Harvest, that I have a wisp of direction and it's like, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> and we'll figure it out as we go. It doesn't matter when Alan says, and so what do you, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes that's how it is. And I've gotten better at just going, okay, I mean, these trees that are in the retention pond, I was having a conversation Sunday, and somebody who actually walked the, that piece of land said, there's some real trees in there. And I said, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I don't want to be overly spiritual, but I have this sense of direction that we can handle it. So that's where we're going to start. I don't, I don't have the end worked out yet. I don't know how we're getting there, but this is all I got. And we're going to go with it and see how it goes. Lent to the feet, and that's about as far as I'm seeing right now. So yeah. we're going to go there. <laughs> and, and there's many times in life where, if you got some sense of direction, that's good. You got a starting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was you know Confucius says, you know, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single footstep. You know, or how do you eat an elephant one, one bite, bite at a time? Or the Hobbit said, you know, it's a dangerous thing walking out your front door. So you just got to start. Yeah, there's some That's great good. stuff in there. Good, good. Any comments from the internet? Nope, no comments, but uh, people still watching. All right. And Isaac says, God bless y'all. Good night. Thanks, Isaac. Good night. <laughs> he said he's just listening and enjoying it. The insight is good. Um, He's, he's getting he's getting filled up to preach somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, we got uh, one more block. It's a good size one, Sam. Ready Let's for me? Thirty-one to the end of the chapter. How many numbers is that? For, Forty-six, I think. Forty. Yeah, forty-six. Fifteen. Fifteen verses. Here, thirty-one. Great potential for drama here. Just, oh my! Just letting you know. You had to ramp him up, didn't you? Sure. <laughs> You're in the drama club at school or something? No. Oh, we should be. Not yet. <laughs> but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty when you, and gave you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did, what? when you did it to one of the at least of these my brothers, what? When you did uh, restart. No, no, restart. Ready. And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the internal fire prepared for the de devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When, we, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Mm. Excellent. <coughs> Great reading. I bet your dad heard you. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think they I think they all heard him. Everybody heard him. 
I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> there is there is a theatrical element. Usually in theater, you just have a stage and an auditorium, and you got to project. Mm -hmm. Good job, you got it. You're not you're not helping my ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm commending a, a, a little one and using his talents. Performance yes. arts for the Lord. There you go. All right. So, uh, shoot, this one. Um, you know, I, I dig into this, and I might be wrong, but I feel like it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I, I feel like it's not just a, it's not just a, a warning, but an instruction too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, he's saying, you know, he's he's, you know, like Kim said earlier, he's going through, he's telling you what's going to happen, at in the end, at the end, at the end of the chapter, at the end, <laughs> when the book is done. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he, in my opinion, he's. He's stripping away all the mystery to it in, in this right here. Mm. It's, it's, you can go into the book of Revelation and you can bury yourself in that thing. I have a couple times and I come out, I try to uncross my eyes ah. and I you know, try to get my, my head back on straight. So you can dig into Revelation and I encourage you to dig into the Bible. But if you're really wondering what, the, what it boils down to, it's right here. Yeah. 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 It's right here. That's right. He's going to separate people. Yeah, right and left. Yeah, you know, and, and I can I can tell you right now, you want to be on the right side yeah. of that. Um, and it's interesting here that he the, that Jesus talks to him and he says, "You have done so much for me. Here are all the things that you've done for me." Yeah. And clue into this: these are the righteous people. The people who have done these things yeah. are clueless. Yeah. Now, again, I'm going to diverge a little bit, but think about what he said earlier when, when he, we were talking a couple chapters back, and he was talking about beware people are going to say, you know, the Messiah's over here, or he's in the field, or he's in the desert. Don't go over there, he's not there. When he comes, it's going to be in, in glory, and everybody's going to know. That is him. Right. So this is right after that. Okay. So you can understand a little bit of the confusion because there's going to be people that are going to look in and the awestruck. I don't, I don't know what the word is to say and mm -hmm. say, when did we clothe you? Because this is that never happened. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Keith Green did a version of this. And he's been in heaven for decades now, but he read this story and turned it into a song so he's playing piano and doing it mm -hmm. and I'll never forget that this passage he goes well we fed a lot of people and, and we gave away clothes to homeless folks and, and visited in prisons and hospitals but I would never forget that face yeah you yeah. know nobody looked like you Jesus oh yeah and um, you know I've, I've, I've really ignored this um, story for a long time in my Christian journey because I was raised spiritually in a church that was very spiritual and not very practical. And this looked like salvation by works. And that was, you know, you, we just don't do that. And in our, our work in the city, and, and credit to John and Janet Blevins for really kind of starting to drag harvest into it, and it was out of their hearts and their work that you know, God birth shift destiny, and we're doing a much better job with all that now. Like they, Love Inc. They has partnered with Love Inc. Yeah, yeah, they were instrumental. I mean, Janet was the call center coordinator; she ran the call center. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, Patty mentioned it about loving your neighbor. You say you have love, show me, mm -hmm. and you don't do good works without there really being something there. That, that's representative. They, they work together. Faith and works go together. And so it's really just proven to me it isn't a question of do you, do you get saved by doing these good works? Well, no, but a, a good tree bears good fruit. Yes. And, and if, if you're connected to people and you see that, and, and to some measure they don't recognize it, but we, we've made this comment for years and it helps drive this. We learned as we started to 
you know, pastor in a church and do children's ministry especially, when you make an impact on someone's child, you touch their heart in a way that nothing else can. And we've seen through the years as we've loved people's children and we were able to get through some truth to them that maybe, you know, they tune out mom and dad, but they catch it at, at church somehow. Now take that concept and apply it to God and his kids. You touch his heart when you love his children, when you care for them. Um, you know, you did it to him. Literally, it, it's almost like that nursing mother thing. When you touch them, you touch me. If that baby gets a cold, the baby's going to give it to mom, and mom's going to build the antibodies to, to feed back to the child. Um, and if you don't, I was in need and you didn't touch me. Yeah. You know, there's that disconnect that's there. And so, you know, I've struggled sometimes with this because it's like, do I really have to bring the homeless in my house to pass the test? <laughs> can, I, can I give to Code Purple? You know, and, and I think that really is the element of it to say, is, is my heart there to see ministry advance? Not do I have to check all the boxes in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. But am I, well, am I and, doing and not to plagiarize a Sunday message, but I'm reminded of the, the lens of works. Yeah. And your is your light focusing to bring glory to God, or is your is that is that that good works lens yes. focused to bring glory to you or to bring to do something that's not bringing glory to God? And is mm -hmm. that, that where's that heart? Where's your where's your heart at? Mm -hmm. And that concept that you said earlier is that faith um, faith be you can't not have good works if you have faith. Yep. Mm -hmm. Faith faith is the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't please God without faith. Right. And so, um, I, while this is talking about the good works, I think it's talking about, like you said, it's the fruit that you can't get without the tree of, of faith. So it's, yep. it's, sure, you're saying, oh, the fruit is good. But if you didn't have the tree in the first place, then you wouldn't have any of the fruit. Right. That's exactly so right. this is this is at the end, and he's saying, here, here's your fruit that happened, right? Because of your faith and because of what what where your heart was, right? This was the fruit that your life bore, mm -hmm. and that fruit was you clothed me when I was mm -hmm. having clothes, you fed me when I was hungry, you know, you took care of me when I was sick, and visited me when I was in prison. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah, I, I always go back to that picture of Keith Green. You know, I would never forget a face like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, and, and it, I just thought it was interesting because it's not just, you would think from a logical standpoint, you would think that the people who are on the, on the left who did not do it mm -hmm. would sure, it would be, no, I would never, why, when would I do that? Because right. you're saying I didn't do it and I didn't. Right. You know, <laughs> when, when, did, when did we have the opportunity to do that? And But even the people who did it, like like you said, it's just like, wow, when, when, we wouldn't have, when did we do that? I mean, we didn't. Right, yeah, we help you. Well, in Isaiah, uh, in that famous passage about the crucifixion, basically says there's nothing about him that would draw our attention. Mm. You know, the suffering servant didn't look any different than anybody else. Mm. And um, again, the instruction of this parable is, you know, I, I was eating lunch today and a guy that they call homeless Jesus because that's what he looks like. He looks like Jesus, but he's a homeless guy in Laurel. Um, you know, walked past my car and when I drove out of the parking lot, he was sitting on the side of the road eating something. And, um, you know, I had that pause of, you know, and God's like, no, you're good. I, I'm not asking you to do anything, but I'm pleased that you noticed and I'm pleased that you're praying for him. And, and there's that heart response that's there. But the instruction is, when someone's in need, God's right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, he, he's close to the brokenhearted. You know, he's close to those in need. And, you know, I, I was raised middle class, and I, I wasn't raised around a lot of poverty, a lot of great dysfunction. I had a pretty good family. And it was tough for me at first. I mean, I, I remember early on, even in pastoring, it was tough to stomach the smell of the hospital to go visit somebody. And what really broke me of that was going to see somebody that I had a real connection with. And I knew they appreciated me pushing through all that to get to them. And it's never been that difficult since then because all the stuff fades away. For me, even visiting family, for me it's just like, I, 
I, I just have this knowing that it's like I, there's nothing I can do mm. from a practical standpoint right. to make you feel better. And I just, I just, I feel so, uh, there's that helpless feeling yeah. that I, and I just go, I don't even know. And then, then you sit with somebody and like, I'm so thankful that you were just here sitting with me. Right. Like, it, That's all I didn't wanted. do anything. <laughs> I didn't do anything. But that was what they wanted. That was what they needed at that moment. Right. right. And even though I didn't know it, you know, that time when Kim called and said, we can't get to the hospital, so I had to go. Can you get there? And right. I'm thinking in my myself, right. me, Alan, said, no, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and Holy Spirit said, you better go. Right. And so I said, sure, I, I can go. And so I went. And, yeah. you know, I prayed a little bit for him, but mostly I sat there that right. time for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, when it was time to leave, and they were just so thankful that I came. It's not like I, I didn't even... What did I do? Right. I didn't do anything. Right. Just being there. Yeah. yeah. It's the ministry of presence. That's exactly but, what it is. But my human heart breaks because I'm going, from my human standpoint, there's nothing I can do to help you. And right. I want to help you. That's my problem. If I didn't want to help, it wouldn't bother me that much. Right. I'm right. sorry to say. I, I'm just being real. No, that's but, true. But but I want to help and I'm going, I, I don't know, I can't do anything. I can't right. I can't make your bone heal any better if it's broken. I can't mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you can but make yeah. the time go by. Because there's nothing yeah. more helpless than being cared for, right? Mm-hmm. right. And just to have someone there. Mm-hmm. You could give them an ice chip, hand them a tissue. Yeah. And watch intellectually, a with them. intellectually, I know that and understand it, but emotionally, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard very to get tough. past. It's hard to get past that other stuff. But also, that's another. That's just another casualty of the COVID thing. Right. When you hear about people can't. They won't let them go in and visit people in, right. in their rooms. I'm thinking. And how how much longer are they taking to get better? Because they don't have that's that important. intangible exactly. that you that these oh, yeah. doctors can't. Yeah. They, they, and you talk to doctors, and they know they know people get better faster yeah. when they have visitors and people that come in love yeah. with them. Oh yeah. You know, but you take ripping that away from them. Yeah. You know, it's horrible. Yeah. And I yeah. understand you need to take precautions, but you could take precautions and still let people get in there. Yeah. Right? Appropriate precautions. You know? yes. It doesn't even make yes. sense what they're doing. Yeah, I have a fellow pastor whose wife is a nurse in Nanticoke, and uh, and he said she worked the COVID ward and she became the chaplain of the COVID ward because she saw that need for the ministry of presence. Mm-hmm. What they're doing now in the ER is ridiculous. My wife had to take her dad to the ER the other day, and they wouldn't let her sit with him. Right. He doesn't speak hardly any English. Yeah. She took him because he couldn't stand on his own. He was very dizzy, and and I mean he had, you know. And he, I'm not talking about any wait times or anything. Right. I understand they're backed up, and that's there's compassion there for these people who are working. I understand that. What I'm saying is, they wouldn't let Cindy sit with him in the waiting room. Right. That's crazy. I don't. I'm thinking I didn't run in that with Sam, and somebody said, well, he's under he's under 18, so you you can sit with him. Right. I'm thinking, how can you not sit with the person that had to have your help to even walk into the room? Right. I understand there's going to be some wait time. I understand that, but I don't understand how can how can you do that? What, and translation, happening? especially when you live in the same household, you yeah. can go. Oh yeah, it's like what, what's the ER? Yeah. It's ridiculous. I sleep next to him every night. I can't <laughs> sleep next to him. Yeah, we're breathing the same the air. Hospital, yeah. I think it's going it to be okay. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, when they make you wear the mask when you go in, that's fine. So sure. even then, it's like I'm not even saying I want to sit beside without the mask. She was fine wearing her mask and right. stuff. I mean, it's just they won't even let anybody sit with the perfect people. Yeah. It's, it, it's, that's crazy. It's getting a little bit out of control. Yeah. You know? A little bit. they got to keep the fear going. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and the compliance going. Well, and, and the idea of this ministry of presence, um, I, I knew this and I had been learning it, but it something that really solidified it for me was I was watching a, a podcast with Rick Warren and Rick um, has alluded to this but this was the chunk that I saw him actually talk about it and I'm watching him now he's on like a Zoom call but you're able to see him and he's talking about it. he's talking about his son dying his son committed suicide and he starts talking about being on the other side of the equation when it comes to mourning and you can't do anything for him and his wife. And he's on the other side. And he's like, there's nothing to say. The greater the tragedy, the less there's anything you can say about it. And it, it really impressed me. Because, I mean, he's a pastor of maybe the largest church in the United States. 
but he he and the culture of their church is committed to small groups. So he's in a small group because everybody who's in their church is in a small. They have more people in small group than show up for Sunday worship. And he said, our small group came to our house, and we were like, we don't have any food. We and they're like, we're not asking you to host us. We're coming to be with you. Mm-hmm. And they started cooking, and they started finding food, and and then they're like, we'll give you some sheets and towels, and they're like. We'll handle where we sleep. <laughs> We're just here to be with you. And they crashed on the f- living room floor and on couches and stuff. And they said, "We're not leaving until we can look you in the eye and think you're going to be okay being alone." Mm-hmm. And it's like his his paradigm had a shift from "I'm the pastor and I'm the host of my friends in my house" to "Oh, you're here to prop us up while we walk through something we never That's imagined tragic. we'd have." Yeah. And, and watching his face as he's talking about this, because he's not a super emotional guy. That's powerful. He's, he's kind of cut and dry. But he said, what the only thing they could do was be there. Mm-hmm. And so what they all did was be there. And yeah, there was food, you know, when we could eat. Really, they fed one another because they were able to eat and we weren't. Um, you know, they talked a little bit amongst themselves, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but... It just drove that home for me, you know. I mean, you know, Dave Trader is a part of Harvest, just lost his son not too long ago. And it was like a fresh lesson, and I'm a word guy. That's what I do. I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, I deal in words. There's no words, mm-hmm. you know. So every now and then I'll, I'll shoot Dave a text and say, I'm praying for you, thinking about you, praying down your street that God will flood down your street, mm-hmm. you know, and get to your house. But on a human level, it, it does feel very helpless. But I've learned through the school of hard knocks or walking through stuff with people that it, it's a real thing, you, that you're just there. Grief and, is a difficult thing. And, and that connection, it's amazing to me. That, again, the instruction for us guys is that God feels deeply connected to these needy people. Yes. Um, here it is from um, the message. The king answers him, says, I tell you the truth, whenever you fail to do one of these things to someone who is being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it to me. Mm -hmm. And I had the experience twice in the last couple months, but I I remember, and I I owe this to the Lord through Shift Destiny, and and so thankful for John Rittenhouse's obedience and birth in that ministry, of knocking on a stranger's door. And suddenly God's heart for them being downloaded to me, how excited he was and how eager he was to bless them. And I didn't even know who they were. I've never met the person on the other side of the door. And God's heart starting to fill my heart and go, wow, he really loves this person because I'm, 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 you know, I'm halfway between peeing my pants and bawling my eyes out and I haven't even met them yet but all this download is is coming. Mm -hmm. That's how deeply connected he is. And again, they're both unaware. Yeah. But we shouldn't be, because we have it to read. Mm -hmm. That we should go, oh, wait a minute, that person in need, you know, homeless Jesus, when I see him on the streets in Laurel, my heart should at least go out. I should at least pray for him. Um, And most people who are homeless, there's either a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue or both. Mm -hmm. Um, every now and then it's purely an economic thing, but that's the minority of things. So there's a complication of things there. A $20 bill is not going to solve that problem. There, there's a lot that's going on there. But it's just a heart of compassion to say, what can I do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, this morning I, I was, um, actually I was closing <laughs> police station prayer. And so I had my phone out and I'm reading a scripture. And uh, I'm, I'm about to say the closing prayer, my phone rings. <laughs> And I have to hit the client and call him back. And it's Kamisha, and she's got a client who's in need and calling to see if I can help or can I give her the number for Love Inc. And I'm thinking, somebody on my team is doing the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I shared that with the pastors. I said, here's a testimony, guys, you want to hear this? Somebody in my church was helping people and called to see, can we help or is there some other number? And I was like, and it's this, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. There, there was care being given for somebody. Yeah. So, well, and I think that's part of it when you when you try and sift through the concept of uh, he's talking about works here in his words, but what he's really talking about is that compassion, that heart of compassion. 
Um, and that yeah. comes from you opening your heart to God because, again, it's that concept of we love because he loved first. You know, we have compassion because he shows what compassion is. Yeah. Uh, and not trying to bottle that up to just your family or just your, you know, yeah. the, the, the scripture that even, even evil people won't give their kids a, a you know, snake when they ask for an apple kind of thing. Yep. Um, but don't bottle that compassion up to just your family or your friends. That yeah. is open to don't limit it to, to the pleasant. Everybody there are many unpleasant mm -hmm. situations that need your compassion and attention, and we don't get to pick and choose. Right. If someone's smelly, they're smelly. Yeah. Find a way to deal with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, and it's and it's that concept. I, I do love that phrase that talks about Jesus a number of times. It don't just have the compassion, but be moved by the compassion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because when you're moved by the compassion, then you act from that state of compassion. And that's what this is talking about. And how many gold stars is God going to give me for this? Yeah. 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 Again, we were at the police station this morning, and it, it blesses and challenges me. The chief of police in our city started talking about the holidays mm -hmm. causing mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. It squeezes people where the holes in their life or their families show up. That mm -hmm. being homeless is more difficult in the cold. Mm -hmm. And I thought... How awesome that the guy who's the chief of Lock em Up has that heart of compassion yes. and is, is pouring that into our police force. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, felt, it honestly feels like he's on the team in terms of ministry, in terms of doing these things we're reading about. Yeah. And, um, and that's a cool place to be, you know, when you see that kind of stuff happen. It certainly wasn't always that way here in Seafood. So it is an instruction to us. We should be seeing Jesus in those people with needs. Because um, even if they weren't instructed, we have been now. <laughs> and whatever measure we can do. You know, it isn't about ticking all the boxes. It's well, it's about not about do, doing five talents or two talents. Right. Or what, it's whatever you're given and what you can do. Yep. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. So if I could do a little wrap-up real quick. Yep. I have a little summary. If you can summarize the um, string together, the theme of the three parables that he's giving, right? Um, embrace the Holy Spirit. Be sure that you got the Holy Spirit. Mm. Let the Holy Spirit lead you into using your talents and gifts for mm. the kingdom of God. And if you're doing that, you're going to reach people and you're going to meet the needs around you. Mm. Because the Holy Spirit's so full of abundance that where you go, you're going to be full of abundance and you're going to pour out to those around you. You cannot get that it That is awesome. Can you pray, pray us these and pray, I will. And I, and pray us in those things? I want to ask you us to uh, remember to pray for Dee Elliott, Dolores. Um, mm -hmm. She's still waiting for wound care to get back to her. She still has some pain. So we're going to pray. Dee, we're, we're on it. We're on it. We're going to pray for you as we close Absolutely. right now. So, Father, we, we just thank you for the message that you give us to, to be ready by being filled with the Holy Spirit, to use our talents wisely mm -hmm. us, and, uh, and effectively and invest them into the kingdom, the things of the kingdom, and to be cognizant and uh, mindful of the needs of the folks around us. We pray for D. Uh, Elliot yes, tonight, Lord. God. We, we yes. pray right now healing on her body completely, Lord. We thank you that you spared her in that car accident for a reason, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we just declare right now that she is healed and spirit-filled. Sickness and disease are far from her. We uh, speak healing over her body. And Lord, I pray that you would bring the resources into her hands that she needs mm -hmm. uh, to go forward. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to meet all of her needs, Lord. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would enlist some folks to do exactly what this last... Uh, parable said and to go help her out and so God we thank you for doing that we thank you Lord for um, those that you're going to enlist that you're going to bless her but you're also going to bless them as well and Lord we look forward to you using us to meet the needs of our community coming into this holiday season we thank you for it all Lord in Jesus name Amen, Amen. 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 next week same back time same back channel yes sir that's right